Good evening, everyone, um, and thanks to all of you for joining us. I'm Rhoda Boateng, Archive Supervisor at Black Cultural Archives. Um, welcome to the first of our three online events commemorating 40 years since the uprisings across the UK. Black Cultural Archives was initiated in 1981, and so our history is very much intertwined with the uprisings, especially those which took place in Brixton. The panel tonight will be exploring media, terminology and representation, looking at and reflecting on the portrayal of the uprisings and black resistance movements more broadly in the media and thinking about the responses and activities of black led and community press initiatives. Before I introduce to our panelists and hand over to our chair for the evening, I just wanted to say a couple of notes on housekeeping. There will be a Q&A after the main discussion, so you're invited to put your questions in the chat throughout the event and we'll put them to the panellists after the main discussion. Um, also a note on the chat, we'll be keeping an eye on it, so if you have any concerns, please send us a message and our team will follow up with you. For those of you who would benefit from captioning, you're advised to turn on the automated closed caption service, which is available via the YouTube live stream. Um, this event is also being recorded and will be uploaded to our YouTube channel after the event, along with a full transcription, which will be made available on our website. It's now my pleasure to introduce our panelists for the evening. So joining us tonight is Zainab Abbas, former International Secretary of the Black Liberation Front. We're also joined by PhD candidate Naomi Oppenheim and journalist Amanda Thomas Johnson. Um, and just a massive thank you for all of you um, for taking part in this event tonight. Our chair for the evening is Lester Holloway, who is Policy Officer for Anti-Racism at the Trades Union Congress. So without further ado, I will hand over to Lester. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, good evening and welcome to everyone. And uh, thank you to Black Cultural Archives uh, for putting on this discussion, Uprisings, uh, 40 Years on Media, Terminology and Representation, which are all uh, uh, distinct uh, issues in their own right, but we uh, are attempting to uh, explore the common threads uh, between them, uh, and especially the common threads between all of those things um, and the uprisings. Uh, my name is uh, Lester Holloway, and um, I previously have had a background uh, in the black media um, at The Voice and New Nation newspapers. Uh, I've also been an activist, I've uh, been at the Running Me Trust, and uh, as Rhoda said, I'm currently at the Trades Union Congress uh, leading a project uh, on anti-racism. Um, the guest speakers, um, I will, um, you'll, uh, you can see, uh, uh, Naomi Oppenheim, uh, Zeynab uh, Abbas, and Amanda uh, Thomas uh, Johnston. Um, I'm going to, to ask them to uh, introduce themselves uh, fully and to um, say a few words uh, uh, on the um, uh, topic at hand, and then um, you know, we'll have a discussion. And uh, as Rhoda said, we'll be um, taking questions uh, from you as well. So put questions. Uh, you know, in the comment box um, uh, whenever you like. So you don't have to wait uh, uh, for a signal. So uh, just, uh, you know, even if you've got a question now, just uh, uh, put it in. Um, that's uh, the best best way, really. Uh, and then we'll have an informal discussion. Um, I'm going to use Chair's prerogative just to um, start off with a, with a few words uh, from myself, uh, which is that, um, you know, there is this uh, uh, question about whether, you know, it's an up whether um, something is an uprising or or a riot. Um, I'm not even going to get into that as far as I'm concerned. It's either an uprising or a rebellion. Uh, but more importantly, there's actually a story uh, behind the event. And uh, that's a story uh, of oppression uh, of the system uh, that up upholds that oppression, as well as the people uh, doing the uh, physical oppression on the streets, which is uh, uh, the police. Um, but also a story of organized uh, movement of resistance, uh, whether that be the anti-racism movement uh, or trade union movement, or both uh, working together. And it's, uh, it's very uh, prescient that uh, uh, today we are talking about um, uprisings and looking back um, at a time in which um, Small Axe, um, uh, the series by um, Steve McQueen, is, uh, is being honoured, uh, which includes, as I'm sure you've already seen, uh, an episode on, on the mangrove um, uh, in Notting Hill and uh, police brutality uh, and the legal fight uh, against that. Um, and I was a teenager uh, when uh, the Brixton um, uprisings, Toxteth, Hansworth and Chapeltown uh, took place. 
Um, but uh, although that was then, I think this is really a, a never-ending story, and uh, you know, it's worth remembering that stop and search rates are now currently uh, worse uh, for black people than they were uh, during the sus laws uh, of the, uh, the early and mid 80s. And black people continue to die in police custody as we've uh, seen recently uh, with uh, Mohammed Hassan in Cardiff um, and others. Um, as far as the media are concerned, um, you know, we, we see over and over again that the police get their story out first when it comes to uh, deaths in custody, which have uh, often been the, uh, the, um, the last straw that's broken the camel's back when it comes to the previous uprisings. And that story is about drugs, it's about violence, it's about, uh, you know, black people with superhuman strength. And we've seen that story come out with the deaths of Roger Sylvester, of Mikey Powell, and of Sean Rigg. And I've covered those cases uh, previously. Um, but also, uh, it's a, they, they, those uh, uh, cops are actually protected by a well-oiled system. Um, uh, that well-oiled system we saw um, more recently in the United States, where um, Derek Chauvin, who although he'd just been prosecuted uh, for the murder uh, of George Floyd, thought that his badge would offer uh, that protection. Um, so for me, it's not just about policing or Babylon's enforcers, it's also about in the institutional and structural racism across society uh, which holds these things in place. Um, sort of finally, I think it's worth mentioning that it, as far as the media are concerned, that the, um, uh, the march that took place after the, the New Cross fire, uh, where, where so many people lost their lives, uh, that march uh, went down Fleet Street. And when it was going down Fleet Street, which was the, which is the epicenter, or was the epicenter uh, of the national media, um, people threw banana skins out of those windows in Fleet Street. Um, so, you know, the, the media themselves, the mainstream media, I think have a lot of questions to answer. And I want to finally end with this, that, you know, recently we saw the launch of the, the Tony Sewell Report, the Commission on Race and Ethnic Disparities. And we saw it launched with a media blitz, which was implying that racism is over. Um, and that, again, is a, is a case of people getting their story in first uh, before the real story uh, before the real story happens. Uh, so there's a lot of issues going on um, that we uh, uh, that we can discuss. Uh, so uh, let's actually um, get cracking. Um, you've, uh, you can obviously see all, all of our guests. And um, I, I want to, I guess, um, sort of kick off uh, really by um, um, asking, uh, or let, let me uh, just start with, uh, with, with, with Naomi. Um, you're, you know, you've been doing um, research uh, on uh, the, the black media. So uh, what, what role have they really played, you know, in these um, situations uh, over and above um, basic journalism? Um, so I think throughout my research, I really looked at Caribbean publishing um, in Britain and also um, the black press. What you see is kind of this intense need for these independent outlets to exist in a context where kind of the mainstream media is both kind of shows a level of disinterest and a total lack of care, but it also, um, you know, totally kind of denigrates black communities in the UK, which just makes it kind of absolutely essential for these independent grassroots organizations to rise up so that they can kind of uh, not only kind of represent black communities in a much more kind of honest and full way and attend to the needs of those communities, but also to kind of place black struggles that are going on in Britain in an international context um, in a way that kind of the mainstream media just does not attend to in kind of in any shape or form um, and kind of the, the need for kind of independent black media and independent black publishing um, has existed you know kind of as, as long as media and publishing has existed um, globally and kind of in my research although I'm focused on the post-war period part of what I'm trying to do is kind of is trace this longer history of independent radical publishing, of thinking like about figures like Robert Wedderburn in the early 1800s, um, that you know published his own autobiography about the horrors of the slave trade. Thinking of people like Una Marson in the 1930s, um, a committed anti-colonial feminist journalist from Jamaica, that was part of the League of the Coloured Peoples, um, and yeah, thinking about this kind of this longer history of wanting to represent yourself, wanting to kind of engage with politics on an international level and just, yeah, kind of how vital that is um, in, yeah, in a context 
of a media and a state that that doesn't care and that, yeah is both oppressive and violent. Uh, Amanda, or Zainab, do you want to come in with your reflections on, on the media um, and uprisings? Shall I go, Amanda? Um, uh, feel free. My reflections are, that because I'm a child of the time, and uh, I was very active with the Black Liberation Front in the early 80s and the 70s. Um, we ran a newspaper called Grassroots. And the reason we ran the newspaper is that issues concerning the black community were definitely not represented in the mainstream media. In fact, uh, our image and uh, our people were criminalized uh, at every, in any situation involving the mainstream media. That's why the New Cross uh, demo went down Fleet Street it was to make our point that they were part of the problem, certainly not part of the solution. But I think that is, um, it hasn't changed since the 80s. Uh, in fact, I think it's worse. Um, people laugh when I say that, but I do think it's worse. And you just pointed out how, you know, um, these recent, I know it, it, it's almost a nonsense to talk about it, but this Meghan Markle business, is a prime example of them getting a bit between their teeth on someone who's got an ounce of black blood in them. And um, although she's 50%, um, she's mixed race. Um, uh, but the, the whole relationship with the black community of the mainstream media is one of denigration. Um, rarely are our people uplifted in any shape or form. Unless, unless, like Sewell and his report, uh, we follow the um, government line or create a, uh, a dialogue which represents uh, everything we're not <laughs> and represents what the political parties want us to believe is happening. Um, so I think the black media is an absolute essential part of the black community otherwise our news isn't news at all and uh, one of the big things that we did in the blf was to internationalize our struggle and bring the other the struggle of black people to our people in in the uk the the, uh, the grassroots publication that you were involved in at the time and um, what would you say um uh, saying there that the role was for that? Was it a tool for um, activism or was it reporting uh, on, on what went went down? Um, I mean, I, I know, for example, that in the United States, the Black Panthers had a very successful um, newspaper which sold, I think, hundreds of thousands of, of copies um, uh, every every single yeah. edition, which was uh, uh, quite amazing. And, and that was much more than newspaper, wasn't it? It was, an, it was a, a tool for, for activism. Well, I think I think our newspapers were a tool for activism. Grassroots was definitely a tool for activism, um, and and also it was a tool. It was an information sheet. Um, as we would talk about what was happening in the UK, for instance, we would link the struggles in Birmingham and Leeds and around the and Liverpool and around the country to what was happening in London. We would also talk about Southern African liberation what was happening in Palestine, what was happening in Latin America, and this continued. So I think we, uh, we, our job was to inform and to inform our communities in the UK as well as our communities international about what was happening in the UK. Yeah, Amanda, do you want to jump in? I know that you've worked for um, some um, major mainstream uh, news outlets. So you've been in the belly of the beast, uh, if, you, if you like. Yeah. Um, well, what was that like? I mean, you know, I, I have worked for um, those sort of mainstream outlets, but actually my, my message today was to talk really about the importance of more community um, type publishing. I guess I guess I come to this um, wearing a couple of hats. Um, I'm a journalist. I've worked in uh, Senegal, West Africa for the last three years, um, but also um, my, my father, Buzz Johnson, um, founded one of um, the sort of m more significant um, sort of black radical presses um, during the 1980s. Um, so I've kind of seen both sides um, um, of it. I think, I think what's really interesting though about when we talk about um, community presses 
is um, how much they are really part and parcel of struggle with themselves. Um, if we take, if we go all the way back to um, the West Indian Gazette, which was founded by Claudia Jones um, in 1958, um, this is this is really comes at a time where black people, you know, the Windrush generation, we as we often talk about, um, are facing um, you know racial discrimination on on you know you know on a massive scale. The Notting um, Hill riots um, take place a few months after um, the paper is founded, and what these newspapers do is that they they help to create a sense of identity and a sense of community. And when I, when I say that, I'm not talking about necessarily just talking about Brixton or talking about Notting Hill, but also a sense of global community as well. Um, while black people might be a minority in this country, as as as, as we're often called, when when we look at when we look at ourselves um, across the world. Um, we see that actually we're part of um, a much larger movement of black and brown, um, you know, sort of people. So, um, and I, I think the West Indian Gazette is a really important, um, you know, sort of launch pad for a lot of the other um, sort of publishing ventures that come afterwards. You know, John DeRose's New Beacon Books. Um, we know about the Race um, Today Collective, uh, Jessica and Eric Huntley at Bogle Overture. And what, what's, what's fascinating about it is that you have... Um, Yes, it's led by a black woman, but you have other figures such as Abhi Manu Manchanda, who's you know who's an Indian basically, who's also um, working at, at, at this at this publication. The publication is talking about um, liberation movements in in Asia as well as Africa. It's talking about Latin um, America as well, um, and I think it's a very important um, sort of example um, for us to um, you know to think about how we um, you know talk about the sort of media today. I'm I'm. I, you, I, you know, fair enough. You know, I got the Telegraph. I got for the Telegraph and and the BBC and all that sort of stuff. But I I I, I do really um, feel that. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. But but I I, I do I do really feel that um, that struggle, um, you know, is is often an, an opportunity for the mainstream media to, to beat us around the heads. But it's also an opportunity where we take where we actually take back that narrative and create our own um, sort of media. We've seen in the last few years. We've seen the rise of like Navarra Media. We've seen Gaudem. Um, and, and and you could say that that was something probably a result of the Corbyn moment, you know, um, as well. Um, so I th I, th I think there's a way to also look at struggle um, in a more positive way as, as generating um, um, opportunities for us to take back the narrative. Yeah. There's a very interesting point that you raised there as well about uh, you know the current mm. new media such as uh, Navarra and and, and Galdem, uh, because I, I feel that you know there's a, very much a sort of a political strand that runs through them. So it's not just about activism; it's also about politics as well and you know looking back we had um, Arif Ali with uh, uh, the Caribbean Times and obviously you mentioned you know the West Indian Gazette you know with, uh, with Claudia Jones um, and there's been other examples as well uh, where you know historically um, the the black media has um, has actually had a uh, as a, has, ha has actually had a socialist politics you know um, a communist exactly. politics, a communist politics uh, uh, quite quite often um, sure. and, you know that has actually really been the glue that you know, connects it to the liberation movements. Uh, you know, um, uh, during the the age of, of empire. Um, so, so it's interesting that um, you know, for, for me, I think that um, where elements of the black media went wrong, um, certainly you know, from sort of the nineties um, into the noughties, uh, is that they lost that um, activism uh, and they lost that uh, they lost the politics as well, uh, and actually you know became uh, or tried to become imitations. Of the mainstream media, as opposed to what they were set up for in the first place. I think one of the points I'd like to make is you you mentioned um, the liberation movements. What you've got to remember is in the seventies and eighties, especially, uh, liberation movements were called terrorist organisations in this country, um, and right up until you know. Mandela came out of prison. The ANC was a prescribed organization in this country. So I, 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 without the black media, without the various voices that stood up for Southern African liberation or liberation of, of people of color around the world, um, they would have been, you know, we would have been ignorant. <laughs> Certainly the Telegraph and the, the Mail and the Times were not giving us the story. Um, so black, the black media played an enormous role. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I, mean I, would, I, would, I would definitely add to that, um, that the black media plays an important role um, in terms of educating um, people as well, providing um, a sort of political 
um, education for you know you know for a lot of people. And these and you know, these are, these are communities which are, are facing, for example, institutional racism in schools. And you know we we spoke about small acts and you know a small book. I mean, it's only like maybe fifty pages long. But how the West Indian child is made edu educationally subnormal no, in the British school system um, by Bernard Cord, um, you know, has a, has a massive impact. Um, you know, across um, the sort of you know parents, the Black Parents Movement. I mean, parents who who are trying to basically um, ensure that their children are taken seriously in the classroom. Um, so, 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 so really, these publications um, are really sort of actually um, helping us um, every step along the way um, by by you know uh, as a form of education, but also as a form of community expression as well. Um, and you know, Race Today Collective is it's covering poetry. It's Linton Quasi Johnson, um, you know, and others, and and people like John LaRose are also connected to artistic movements as well. Um, so, so, so they have a much broader, um, you know, um, sort of purpose um, than than just sort of you know reporting on the news. They're offering analysis, they're offering literary reviews, film reviews, um, art, poetry, you name it. They're, they're they're really given the full kind of mass media package almost. Yeah, definitely. And I think also the fact that so many of these kind of press and publishing initiatives are so grounded in the community. If we think of you know Routon Road in Brixton. We have Olive Olive Morris got in one two one Routon Road. We've got the Sabar Bookshop. You know that's where the Brixton Black Women's Group is based, and you know this bookshop is a centre of activism and learning and knowledge exchange. And then down the road, you've got the Un the Unity um, Bookshop, part of the Black Panthers. Um, you know another really important space of kind of knowledge sharing and th this idea that kind of books are deeply embedded in liberation struggles and books are not something that you kind of sit in your room and read alone they're something that you talk about and share and discuss and then you know also on Routon Road is the Race Today Collective so it's also this kind of incredibly sort of lively grounded world of, of books and publishing and media that is totally embedded in yeah kind of on the ground activism. The BLF head, head office was our bookshop called yeah. Grassroots. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. 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 You know, our people were thirsty for knowledge, yeah. very thirsty for knowledge, and the knowledge about us, not just about, you know, the mass of society. They wanted to know what was happening in our parts of the world, and we could yeah. give it to them. And we yeah. did. Uh, put your comments as well into, uh, and questions, um, you know, into the, uh, uh, the comment box. So we'd like, love to, um, uh, to, to hear what you've got to say on that. Um, just uh, um, another aspect I just wanted to, to raise really was that uh, you know, at the time of the, of the uprisings, the rebellions, uh, whatever you want to, um, uh, to call it, um, what the role of um, the uh, black media and publishing was in relation to having a, an inter-community conversation about what to do, um, about how to, how to respond rather than, you know, because we, we talked in a way about you know, some of the organising part of things, but there's, there's a stage before organizing really which is sort of you know, really working out you know what's what's going on and you know how we feel about it and you know and, and laying the groundwork uh, for, for for activism so uh, does anyone want to come in on that point um i just want to say in relation to that yeah. uh, you two youngs are not coming forward fast enough here <laughs> um i uh, remember that in 1981, before the Brixton riots, there was that operation, that police operation, which was actually fundamental to what happened. There was this mass stop and search. I think it was over a thousand people or about a thousand people and hundreds were arrested. That was why the riot or uprising, as I'd like to say, happened, okay? The same happened in Totsworth the year before. The same happened in, uh, where was it? Bristol the, the year before, so 1980. These riots or uprisings that, you know, I prefer an uprising, but people call them riots in the mainstream press, don't happen in isolation. And I think it's important, this is where the black media came in uh, and came into its own because the press was calling it, um, you know, these black people out of control, uh, attacking the police. 
And nobody mentioned the fact that the police had actually attacked the black community in all of these places first. And this is where um, the black media played its proper role, proper role, and in informing the community of what went on. And as late as 2011, do you remember the uprisings in 2011? To this day, the media still calls them riot and looting. But these things don't happen in isolation. They happen because there is a, a sense of injustice, a sense of frustration that's building up like a pressure cooker, and it just explodes. But they don't happen in isolation. And, and, and again, as I said, the, that's the role of the black media is to make that very, very clear. Mm -hmm. I was um, I was looking at, it was actually the online exhibition, which is on the Black Cultural Archives website, that's just gone up recently about the uprisings. And it has a, um, a front page of grassroots, just kind of, you know, the week after the uprisings occurred and, and they're calling it an uprising at that time. And I think, as you've just said, Zainab, it really points to the role of the black media of doing this kind of critical reporting and analysis and of kind of understanding kind of that these events are not unfolding in isolation. It's a response to kind of actually decades of state violence, decades of police surveillance that had seriously ramped up kind of throughout the 70s and then, you know, re intensely ramped up in that weekend before with Swamp 81. Um, and then that's also kind of why things like the Sparman report are so, so flawed because it's kind of, it, it's missing out on all this analysis that's already mm -hmm. going on and this analysis that's deeply embedded kind of in those communities. And it's just like, it's a total disregard for that. And again, we see this happening again and again and again, it's just kind of failure to recognize this, this deep critical analysis that's already going on and that already understands kind of how race and racialization plays out as a kind of major factor in the British political landscape. So do you think that uh, the, um, the role of the black media and publishing at the time uh, really um, informed and developed the anti-racism movement and the organizations that resisted? I mean, obviously with uh, you know, the Brixton uprising, for example, there was a, there was a coordinating committee that actually right. um, you know, organized the, the, the resistance. Um, you know, they, they must have been very closely connected with-, with But uh, the coordinating committee came into uh, existence after did it? Okay. Exactly. Uh, it didn't exist. It didn't organize it. You know, it was, you know, the organizing that moment was in response to something. And that response was to the police um, actually flooding the community, absolutely flooding the community and arresting young person after young person after young person just in the street, arresting anybody, anybody they could get their hands on, you know. How many did we chalk up today sort of thing? And it was only over two days, you know, um, the uprising. But prior to that, it was only a, a weekend where they'd arrested over a thousand people. Stopped at now. Well, they just stopped a thousand people. You know, you don't stop a thousand people over a couple of days and not cause a response. Yeah. You know, and it's and people pretend it's not happening today. And this is the big lie, because it is happening today. And Lester, you made that point in your opening remarks, that there is more stop and search now than there was in our day, you know. And it's true. Why, why are we not being angry about it? Why, why isn't the press taking up these numbers, the mainstream press taking up these numbers and saying, you know, look, this is not good. You know, this is much worse than in 1981. I think what I was sort of driving at, perhaps, with that sort of garbled question was uh, was that, you know, the interrelationship between the anti racism movement, or the, the anti racist movement, um, and, the, and the black press. I don't know, Amanda, if you've got any, any views on this. Yeah. Topic, but actually, yeah, I mean, if we're looking over time, what we can see, you know, um, over time is, is, a, is, a, is a rise and fall almost of. Um, uh, the, the fortunes of um, the black press. And we can also see um, a change of fortunes um, uh, with, with the anti-racism movement as well. And, you know, is, is there an interrelationship there? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think, I think that 
I mean, in many cases, um, the black presses, the, the people who ran the black presses were also the people who were also the activists. I mean, you know, they, you know, people like John LaRose. I mean, John LaRose organizes with Darker South the Black People's Day of Action in response to the New Cross um, fire. He's a big, he's a big person in the Black Parents movement. He's in the Black Arts movement. He's part of the Race Today Collective. He's he's also um, found in New Beacon Books um, as well, right? Um, so I mean, you know, th these are figures who are moving across um, these different areas, and 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 in actual fact, in, in the way that we talk, you know, we tend to sort of like atomize these things today. We talk about you have the activists over there, you have the publishers over here, you have the artists over here, but actually, in those days, people expected um, to, you yeah, know, to, to 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 do everything, right? Um, and I think and I think that's something that we've that we've kind of lost. We see it again with um the Huntleys um you had a bookshop um in in West London they were involved in, in you know in the South Hall um sort of uprising anti-racism work there they were involved with Walter Rodney um and his activism in you know in Guyana my father was involved in Grenada um the revolution there he he helps to found um the Claudia Jones organization in Stoke Newton and he's involved um in 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 other movements um as well so there was there was a much more um you know um condensing of of you know of activism of you know of you know of literary work um of publishing all of these things were you know were interconnected and it, it it's hard for me to put my finger um on what's kind of um taken place now but but these things have kind of gradually become separated i think that well i mean one of the things i guess you know must be that a lot of us myself included um you know we can you know we can be employed by the mainstream press or whatever and so we we sort of focus just on journalism and we you know we get sucked in sucked into that and and these you know corporate journalism um you know sees itself as sort of standing i mean in sort of splendid isolation perhaps um from activism you know um you know it's almost in in in, in the corporate journalism world it's almost an insult to be called an activist um you know if you're you know if you're a journalist um so so that you know there's kind of been this but there's but there's also um being the sort of the wearing down a backlash against um our struggles um which has also um had a you know had a had a massive impact um and i think it's it's important that we look we look back at some of these um sort of movements to to inform um how we move forward today well what are the tactics that have really worn um the community down i think i think i i, I think that um you know from the you know from the early early you know early 80s um there you know there was sort of the things like funding given um you know to groups who wanted to uh you know maybe identify on on sort of narrower sort of terms for example um they wanted to identify as being you know caribbean only caribbean or only turkish or only kurdish and 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 whatever and and i think that influx of funding um, in the early 80s and, and many and many of community organizations which are, which, which are still in, still extant today and were founded around that time um i think that i think that's actually served to actually break up um a lot of the sort of the, the, the shared struggle um that we had before um obviously there's been you know we've had thatcherism you know which has really hollowed out you know the trade union trade union movement yeah. we've had the onset of neoliberalism and, and this is not um just in this country but globally as well you know the you know the liberation movements, which were a source of inspiration and a source of, of solidarity, um, have really again been hollowed out, um, and 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 the politics has, has completely been transformed. Um, so I I, th I think a lot has happened both domestically um, and abroad, which has really changed the dy dynamics um, of how we think about these movements. Mm. I just wanted to Amanda touch on the really important point you made about funding, and I think you know when John LaRose spoke about kind of the, the fact that New Beacon Books was totally self-funded, if we also think about Eric and Jessica Huntley, like it was all self-funded. And part of that is, you know, it's not only about retaining autonomy and independence, it's also about the fact if you rely on state funding, that can be ripped away from you at any time. And then, you know, you're, you're, you're vulnerable to state forces when the whole reason you exist is kind of to counter that and that's yeah and as you said that's what you, we see happen in the 80s with the onslaught of fat thatcherism the glc gets kind of destroyed and yeah and so many initiatives are kind of either un unable to exist or greatly weakened by that mm. and i think that was quite deliberate mm. you know, it was a deliberate policy I, mean, I don't mean just a deliberate move it was an actual policy to weaken the black movement as it was at that time. 
you know, we self-funded everything in those days. I mean, uh, yeah. every, uh, we all had jobs, so we all had full-time jobs. Everything we did was to fund what we were doing, you know, mm. like grassroots, and we had to publish it. We had to print it and publish it and distribute it. And the way we did that was we would all chip in to everything. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Can I can I can I can I just come in on that? Right. I mean, one of the interesting things um, for me growing up was my my dad basically funded this publishing venture um, on his own, and you know, you know that 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 was a massive sacrifice. You know, I'll be I'll be I'll be very honest and say that right. You know, we had to do without basically, right? And in many ways, um, you know, and and this was quite normal. I mean. They, you know, these were people who were having to publishers and presses were having to deal with a very, very small market for circulation. You know, relying on a community um, who are you are you know majority working class. You don't have the sort of funds themselves to be purchased in, you know, the yeah. publications. Um, and and then you know you need to obviously you know you want to have a high you know high quality publications. So you need to think about printing and all of those sort of things. And and for, for my for my father, at Carrier Press. Um, when when the sort of like um, the Macintosh computer came out, desktop publishing, that was a way for him to sort of um, you know you know you know way for him to keep his um, kind of cost down, you know, you know you know through technology, um, which 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 kind of links as well to um, you know today as well that we do have technology at, at our at our disposal. But I think one of one of the things I, I always wonder is you know are people today really willing to to spend their lives you know operating out of a out of a hackney um, council flat, um, you know, a leaky council house flat, you know, council flat on, you know, on the verge of eviction, um, you know, not knowing how they're going to live from week to week um, in order to really um, curate the sort of publications um, and the sacrifices our community needs. You know, I think I think that's I think that's a question worth worth asking because a, a lot of a lot of our, our political forefathers and foremothers um, made a lot of sacrifices. And, 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 you know, a lot of them even died, died relatively young as well. Um, yeah. and I think I think that's connected. But we had no choice. That's what yeah. you've got to remember. We had no choice. We didn't do it as heroes of the movement. Your father, you called him a hero, he'd probably slap you. You know, what he did, he did because he had no choice. We believed in things. We had to get our story out. We had to get our, uh, represent our community. And, and he did it that way. It's an interesting point that, so that you raised um, there, uh, Amanda, about um, funding. I mean, just my, my own reflections on, on the demise of um, New Nation, which I thought was, was, more, was more radical than The Voice. Obviously, it wasn't quite a patch on the, some of the publications that came before, uh, whether it's, you know, the Grassroots or, um, you know, or, you know um, Valley's Caribbean Times and so on. But, um, but it was doing better, I think, in terms of content, in terms of um, uh, not flooding the, the paper with... Um, uh, with, with the stories of racism, but actually picking the battles and actually trying to trying to, to fight them and being more an activist in that, in that sense. And um, it went down, and the voice um, survived, which I think you know it sort of tells a story, um, you know, in its own right. That um, the uh, the black press, certainly you know, in the more modern period, um, have actually been relying on on the mainstream, whether that be mainstream private um, advertisers. Uh, or public sector um, adv uh, advertisers uh, and sponsors that can take away um, that money if um, you're not um, uh, if, if, if you're not sort of pulling the um, uh, you, you not you're not sort That's of um, in their tune uh, if you like. And it's quite interesting as well that even though um, New Nation went down at this um, you know during the, the early part of the financial crisis sort of uh, uh, 10, 11 years ago, um, but it also came um, after the the battles that we had. Uh, with Ken Livingston and Lee Jasper, um, and and I think that was also very significant as as well because um, Boris Johnson came in as Mayor of London, um, and you know one of the things that he did was was basically um, try and pull away funding uh, from the Black Press. Why? Because both the Voice and New Nation had actually been defending uh, Lee Jasper because they recognised that what was going on was an attack not just on an individual, but actually uh, not, not even just on, on, on the politician of, of, of uh, uh, Ken Livingston, but it was actually an attack on, on black self-organization. It was an attack on black politics. Yeah. Um, and that, that was what's going on. And, and to be honest, I actually think that in some ways, some parts of the, the old anti-racism movement, if you like, 
have never really recovered from that. I think we're seeing a new generation coming coming through now, uh, but it's taken a long, long time uh, for for that to happen. Which is a completely different question, which is that you know, looking looking at what's happening now with the technology that, that we have, that we don't necessarily have to struggle with the printed, you know, the you know the printing um, sort of that machinery, which is a nightmare. Um, but you know, are we making enough use of um, uh, of technology to um, to mobilise um, the community uh, against um, against racism? Are we? I think. <laughs> please, 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 Anna. No, please, I'm. Please I want to hear what you say. Yeah, I mean, you know, you, you know, the thing with technology right now and some of the social media and stuff is that, I mean, there's just so much information, isn't there? <laughs> you know, um, you know, Im imagine um, back in back in the 1970s, um, Bogle Overture and New Beacon were the main black community presses. They were publishing like five books a year, right? Um, like that, that, like if you, if you were an activist, those would those would be the everyone would be reading those books literally. You know, um, right now there is so much out there. Um, there's this, you know, and and I think I think I think another interesting difference between now and then was that I think reading habits. I think I think people there was a really really a sort of like an emphasis on just reading um, and and reading deeply and and that reading being connected to struggle in a way that it isn't it isn't today. You know, you know we always talk about sort of like reduced attention spans and all that sort of stuff. Um, but a lot, a lot, you know, a lot of people, people like C.L.I. James. I mean, he was he, he was self-taught, uh, basically, more or less, right? Um, you know, we had we, you know we had intellectuals who, um, you know, who you know who were just sort of, um, you know, learning their way through things. Um, and I think that yes, we have technology. Yes, we can communicate. Yes, we can get information out. Um, but it's competing with other information. Um, and there is something about the way we access, te we use technology. Um, which I think um, can actually be quite, quite damaging actually to struggle. Um, some people confuse social media with being a site of struggle when, when I mean, I mean it isn't right. It's, it's, it's a tool, but it is not the struggle itself, is it? Um, so, so yeah, the, the, yeah. Those are my thoughts on on sort of technology and where we are today. But how do you harness this tool you have, or in you know the modern tool of technology? How do you harness that in struggle? Because all I see this new media doing is uh, things like, uh, how do you call it? Um, promoting individuals, um, you know, getting hits or whatever it's called. What is it called? Come on, Amanda, tell me, what is it called? Likes, retweets. Yeah, 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 all yeah, of that, that's yeah. It. I mean, that, that's yeah. it. I, I don't see it. Um, you know, it's hard for us to get information or or target information that we're specifically interested in, like you know things that happen in the black community around the world. Yeah. Um, I, I have I have your publication. I watch Al Jazeera all the time, so I can yeah. get a world view rather yeah. than a, a local view of what's yeah. going. Um, yeah. But I. I don't know how to use the social media that's out there for, yeah. for contacting and for being part of something. This is as far mm. as I go, you know, uh, mm. a meeting mm. or uh, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> it's all yeah. I can manage. <laughs> we have a question, which uh, is a great uh, from uh, Samuel uh, Ampia. So thank you so much for that. And um, uh, please um, you know, send through your questions as well. Uh, you know, we'd like to... Uh, uh, he reviews with on everything that's been discussed. But Samuel says, uh, it was a question to me really, um, uh, Lester, you mentioned in the uh, 90s and uh, noughties, uh, black press initiatives became less radical and political minded. Uh, what conditions do you think uh, led to this? Um, I think that, you know, in a nutshell, if you're looking at the case of The Voice, uh, for example, I don't, I don't want to sort of, you know, um, be just like, you know, um, uh, damning The Voice, but I think what happened was that they, um, uh, the uh, owner of it, who's um, been departed, um, Val McCalla, um, kind of got a bit complacent and actually uh, it became a cash cow um, uh, at a certain time, uh, around the time of the um, uh, Stephen Lawrence inquiry. Um, there were, the, the society suddenly woke up and, you know, you know, looked around their workplaces and realised that there weren't any, any black people and, and the, the voice was the vehicle to try and get um, black people into the workplace. Um, uh, certainly, you know, certainly at an, an entry level sort of um, thing, and a lot of money flowed in. 
Um, uh, but it wasn't used uh, or invested in, in the right way, I don't, I don't think. Um, so it did, it did lose that, that radicalism. And so it became, you know, in, in hock, if you like, to um, the, the um, not scaring off um, advertisers, uh, really. I think that's, that's really what, um, what, what happened. But it's interesting the discussion about what's what's sort of happened um, since because um, you know with new technology um, it doesn't take that much money to actually set up um, uh, publications and we are seeing publications setting up. What I'm also interested in is whether that um, has a knock-on effect to um, sort of galvanising the anti-racist movement even more. I mean, I, I, you could argue that Black Lives Matter, you know, is you know a reincarnation in many ways of of the um, anti-racist struggles against um, deaths in police custody. So I, I count Black Lives Matter very much as, as a continuum uh, as part of that. But um, you know, you know how how we you know continue to use uh, the black media, um, social media, um, every other type of um, way to connect to build to build the movement. Uh, and you know that that is something which you know uh, would interest me. And if we can also involve trade unions uh, much more, uh, you know, in that. Uh, in that process, I think you know we'd be uh, you know we'll be pushing ahead really. Well, Lester, have, have trade unions changed since uh, the early eighties? They were incredibly racist then, yeah. um, and and also they there was this uh, political confrontation with the trade union movements because, as you remember, it was the early eighties and the miners' strike and. Thatcherism and the misery of those years um, that, you know, the trade union movement came under severe attack. Yeah. Well, I think the, um, the the record of trade unions, uh, you know, is not great. Um, and, you know, uh, trade unions like to, um, uh, you know, celebrate, uh, you know, the odd, um, uh, you know, incidents like uh, the Grunwick strike, uh, where you know, there was sort of support, you know, for, for, the, for the Asian um, uh, striking striking women in that factory. Um, but there was a whole range of other strikes that were happening where um, where black and you know, Asian um, strikers were not getting um, that support. Mm -hmm. I think that um, at the time of the Stephen Lawrence inquiry, um, the trade union movement, as well as the public sector, had a sort of step change. Um, so they set up um, the Stephen Lawrence um, task group of trade union leaders. Uh, and many of the initiatives that we actually see today, um, uh, such as you know uh, quality audits, such as uh, leadership training, um, you know those those type of initiatives, uh, those date back from 20 years ago. And and what's happened in the in intervening 20 years is is not enough. Uh, that there's been an outsourcing of anti-racism. That you know trade unions you know want to do you know do the right thing, but rather than actually change their organisations. Uh, they give money to uh, hope not hate or stand up to racism or whatever. It's outsourcing, uh, you know, racism and so uh, anti-racism. So, you know, as a result, there hasn't been coordination between trade unions. So there have been some good anti-racist initiatives that have taken place. So, you know, I'm not saying that no nothing has happened. Things, good things have happened. But sometimes, even within the, within the same trade union, you've got regions that are, are doing well because mm -hmm. you've got individuals that have organized and doing stuff and then you've got another region maybe the next the, the, the next door region which is not doing it and from one you know trade union to another you've got huge differences so what's happening at the moment at the TUC which I'm involved in is to you know try and get those trade unions leaders together once again to do the sort of Stephen Lawrence sort of process all over again um, and and try and get some coordination and leveling up if you like of, of that, that activism. But anyway, I know we've sort of strayed a, a bit from the <laughs> from the media um, uh, side of things. I can't remember exactly where, where we were. So uh, can can uh, uh, one of you help to, uh, to to bring to bring us back? Yeah, I think I think we're looking at um, the sort of conditions that led to um, black presses becoming um, yeah. sort of less, le you know, you know, sort of less radical. Um, and again, I mean, I, I I sort of stick by the idea that that sort of social struggle. Um, is is an important site um, for activism and 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 therefore also um, you know for these sort of black presses as well um, and um, you know you mentioned um, you know sort of you know in more recent times BLM you know BLM UK um, as well um, and and you know these movements and I think that um, what these movements I think I think what we're what we're kind of seeing now um, with BLM I mean the reception was very different from say 
you know, Brixton, you know, 40 years ago, for example. Um, it was a very different type of type of protest. You know, this wasn't a, a sort of um, taking place in a sort of uh, inner city, um, you know, sort of predominantly uh, black working class area, for example. It was in, it was in central London. Um, and um, it was uh, treated um, very differently um, in, 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 in some ways quite, quite positively. Um, but what, what I found interesting is that the, the sort of positive treatment um, of sort of BLM still managed to obscure um, some of the sort of, the, you know, the driving factors. So it still managed to obscure a discussion, um, for example, um, about empire, um, about the driving forces that led to BLM. And we saw, for example, um, um, with the sort of um, almost, uh, you could say, the sort of beatification of, of Patrick Hutchinson, um, no, no disrespect to him at all. Um, he was pictured, um, you know, sort of with this... Um, you know this this dude, um, this sort of far right guy. You know, carrying him, carrying him away from, you know, from you know from the you know from the jaws of, of whatever, um, and that and that in a sense, that kind of positive image. It was it was it was a far cry from um, the depiction of a young, you know, hooded mugger or whatever you got back in the nineteen eighties. But even that kind of quote unquote positive imagery still managed to 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 move the conversation away from talking about the root causes. It then kind of became about you know, respectable black people. It became about, um, you know, we weren't asking why is that white protester there? You know, why were people on the streets in the first place? And so the other side of the coin to the, you know, to the, to the young hooded mugger um, was used um, as a way to stop that discussion um, taking place. We even saw like, you know, pictures of, you know, that image sort of going up in sort of newly gentrified Lewisham billboards and newly gentrified Lewisham and Peckham, um, if that wasn't enough. Um, so, so yeah, I think I, I think struggle is always kind of contested um, in the way that it's depicted in the media and black media. Um, it, it provides an opportunity to kind of seize the narrative, um, and and I think and I think yeah, I think I think it's something that that, that that is ongoing. Even though we haven't had protests, we're still you know involved in this sort of culture war, sewer report, all this sort of stuff is ongoing. Even though that we you know we aren't marching anymore, so yeah, it's an ongoing struggle. That segues really uh, very neatly into a uh, question from uh, Black Candle, uh, which is a uh, double header really. Uh, uh, how can we collectively support publishing and media? And, and the second question, which I think kind of like uh, follows on from what you're saying is, um, how do we put pressure on white media UK landscape? Who wants to uh, have a go at this? Naomi, do you want to come in here? Um, well, that's a, <laughs> I wish I had the answer to both of those questions. Um, and in some way, the way that kind of we put pressure on white the white media landscape is to stop buying um, the pay these these newspapers. And I'm sure the people that are attending this event are not the people that buy these newspapers. Mm. But kind of, I don't really know if there is a way to kind of to, to to shift or shape the messaging that these newspapers are putting out. Kind of, the Daily Mail is always going to be like the Daily Mail. The Sun is always going to be like the Sun. I don't really know kind of the way to change that. What you need to do is is dismantle it and for them to kind of not not really exist or not be so powerful. Um, and the kind of yeah, the the way that they these newspapers, the kind of the power they have to actually kind of to shape policy because you know kind of governments rule by consent by, by by popular consent and kind of these newspapers by um presenting us you know a certain image kind of they they garner public consent for for racist policies and i wish i had the answer of, of how we dismantle them but kind of yeah my only answer is dismantle rather than try to edit or change but I suppose what might be underneath the question, I don't know, maybe I'm just assuming things, uh, is the question about allyship. Because you know, a lot of these um, uh, mainstream media, the, the damage that they do, um, you know, is, uh, yeah, I mean, obviously we, we kind of feel the, the, the hate that, you know, sometimes is, is pumped out. But really, the real damage is actually done to, to the minds of, uh, of white people that actually we need yeah. to have as part of the struggle. So you know, do we just, you know, simply um, rely on, on those white allies that you know just happen to be more progressive minded and you know, yeah. mm. to, uh, you know the uh, the struggle through whatever means or uh, you know do we actually think about um, the the media landscape as a whole and how you know we can can reach out uh, to um, uh, you know have a more wider conversation and you know build a move build a, a unity movement uh, which is which has got strength in numbers not just of, of black people but of, of white people too. 
Yeah, I just, I think there's also a, just one more point about kind of talking about the mainstream media or the white media. You know, another really important point is the mainstream media is not representative of Britain kind of by any shape or form. And it is not, you know, in the way that we've talked about kind of the black press as very much kind of coming out of the community and being connected to it and grounded in it, that is not replicated with the mainstream press and kind of sort of vast majorities of the British population. Like it is a privately educated elite group of people that kind of not only control these newspapers, but make up the majority of, of the journalists that work at these newspapers. So it's also like, it's very much a question of class as well in terms of the media landscape and who is able to access those jobs. But the day after, do you remember the day after the sewer report came out? You could almost predict the headlines. Do you remember? Uh, I mean, the Times and the Mail, you, you, you just knew what the headlines were going to be and the telegraph and you know we've got rid of racism britain is a beacon to the rest of the world and i, I just couldn't believe it and i said somebody is having a laugh here you know somebody is actually using this as a joke and what the mainstream media the power of the mainstream media uh cannot be underestimated the the rupert murdoch this man should be banned from owning anything to do with the media, anything. I mean, I'm not talking about, I'm talking about radio, newspapers, television, in, uh, film studios, anything. The man is a maniac. He uses his power to influence governments around the world. He did it in Australia and he continues to do it in Australia. He did it in Britain and he continues to do it in Britain and he's now doing it in the United States and will continue in the United States. That kind of media ownership has to be curtailed, has to be. And if there was ever a movement that needed to happen, it's that. You know, if you're going to say you're a newspaper and you're a journalist, you better be a journalist and critical journalist. You cannot be a shock jock, you know, and he produces shock shots. They invaded people's privacies, they tapped into people's phones, they, they did all kinds of things. And everybody knows they did it, and they have suffered nothing because of it. Yeah. Yeah, we're coming to the end of the, the show now. I mean, we're just getting going, it feels like. <laughs> we could go on for, for a very, very uh, long time. Um, and I was just about to come in with uh, another question there, but I'm going to actually uh, um, sort of uh, hold that, uh, hold my piece on, on that one. Um, so I uh, just wanted to um, ask uh, all, all of you to just, you know, uh, leave us with uh, just a final, uh, a final comment um, about about the issues we've been been talking about. So uh, who wants to go first? Um, I'm. Uh, you look like your your plans are ready to go. I can I can go. Um, so I, I'm 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 really a firm believer. I think one thing I've taken from this, and um, you know, I'm I'm a firm believer in sort of community journalism, community publishing, um, sort of initiatives. Um, I think that our communities have made you know their largest strides forward um, when we had um, these um, publishers, um, you know, sort of you know you're working, um, and you know. Yeah, you know, corporate media has, you know, I think there are many issues, it's, you know, there's, you know, we've talked about the ownership structure, um, you know, reporting is warped by advertising. Um, there's what, you know, some people call client journalism um, as well. There's a lack of diversity, race as well as class, um, gender as well. Um, and we also should um, pay attention really to the way that the mainstream media um, is part, is, is, is really at the forefront of reproducing racism basically, and framing, framing racial outsiders in this country, framing who is worthy of rights and who isn't, who is British and who is not British. Um, you know, it doesn't matter if you have a passport, <laughs> it, you know, the, you know, the, you know, the media is really at the, at the forefront um, of sort of framing that. Um, and even, you know, when it comes to, you know, interventions, you've seen it before, you know, uh, military interventions and stuff like that, manufacturing consent. So um, my, 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 my sort of emphasis, um, is sort of I feel that community journalism is is a sort of way forward, um, and that our, our investment, um, you know, should you know should really be um, there more than anywhere else. Okay, um, Naomi, final thoughts. Um, 
I would actually kind of take it even further what you just said, Amanda, about the mainstream media as reproducing racism. I think they also produce it at a kind of at a basic fundamental level. Um, and they kind of, yeah, they need to be kind of held much more to account for that. And I agree that I think one of the most important ways to do that is through independent community, self-funded journalism and also mm. publishing. Um, and there are so many important lessons to be learned from the 60s and 70s and 80s. And, you know, hopefully we're kind of at the a turn of a new political time and maybe neoliberalism is on the way out and that's kind of what needs to happen. And there's a, yeah, there's a kind of political galvanization going on at the moment. Um, and I, yeah, I really hope that, yeah, there'll, there'll be more, more independent and community um, press initiatives. Cause I think at the moment that feels like one of the only ways to, yeah, hold those that control the media, those that control public opinion to account, because we cannot rely on those publications to do it, because th they are producing the, the problems. Okay. We've got, uh, unfortunately, uh, no time for these um, um, two questions that are coming at the last minute, but I'm going to read them out, because uh, they know, but, you know, you've got come, you know, you're coming in uh, in a second. I just wanted to uh, see, perhaps, if you can just pick up on uh, on anything, you know, any of these questions from Emily Willis, uh, Willie and uh, Julie Michelle. Um, how do we build global press links? Um, how do we share what's happening across the globe as black people's struggles are international? Um, and uh, Julie says, uh, interesting discussions. Um, are there any list of papers and webcasts available, podcasts, etc., uh, that you can recommend uh, to uh, get uh, get active? Um, so uh, there's, there's a few to um, uh, pick from there. So uh, uh, yeah, thank you. Well, I think what's important here, we're, we're using a medium now. We're on this new medium now. How do we harness it? How do we harness it for the benefit of our communities? And our communities are not just black communities. They're working people's communities. We are, a, a, our struggle is one struggle. It's against a system that doesn't represent us. It's against government that doesn't often represent us. Uh, the idea of voting once every five years is not my idea of a full democracy. Um, I want to be active in my democratic process a lot more than I am able to be active in that democratic process. So I think this medium that we're on now is the future, Amanda. You know, I say that to you because you and uh, Naomi would know how to use it better than I do. But I think this should be a tool that we use to um, interconnect all over the world with each other. Yesterday, I was on a podcast, um, uh, first of all, as a, uh, as a audience member, and then they dragged me in. But it was in New York, and it was a black feminist podcast. And I thought it was wonderful that we were having this discussion um, all over the world. People came in from Brazil, from um, uh, America, from the two coasts of America, from um, uh, South Africa, from Zimbabwe, from all over the world. Okay. These women were in this debate. I'd like to see that about us in Britain, you know, black and white people in struggle together. What was nice for me was to see in the BLM demos in Trafalgar Square, it was heartwarming for me to see black and white kids because in my day, you didn't have white kids joining in. Yeah. Now you do yeah. because they see it's about them as well. So Is let's this, use yeah. this medium in that way. It's a perfect way to end it on and uh, uh, thank you um, so much for that. Um, I've learned a lot, um, and uh, I'm just very grateful for um, for all of you, uh, really um, insightful uh, speakers. Um, uh, so fantastic! Thank you so much, uh, uh, Naomi Zainab um, and and Amanda. I'm just going to hand over back to um, uh, to, to Rhoda now, but I just wanted to say thank you to uh, Black Cultural Archives uh, for for hosting this, uh, and thank you for for inviting me. So uh, over to you, Rhoda. Thank you, Rhoda. Um, 
Thank you so much, Lester, and thanks to all of our panellists for such a rich and enlivening discussion, um, which really centred the importance of media and press and black liberation struggles. Um, as I oh, also for anyone whose questions didn't get answered today, um, I'll try and send those questions over to the panellists and perhaps we can follow up in some way. Um, and as I mentioned at the start, this is the first of three online panels marking 40 years since the uprisings in the UK. And our next panel will take place on the 20th of May and we'll be looking at policing and community um, demands. So for more information about how to attend those panels, you can visit our website, blackculturalarchives.org. And once again, thank you to Zainab, Naomi, Amanda, and to Lester for your time. And a massive thank you to the audience. Hi, everyone.